We're going to invite our two neurologists here who are absolute experts in the field of MS. First, Jack Burks, who's Chief Medical Officer of the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America and a member of the National Medical Advisory Board for the National MS Society. Jack, who's known to many of you. And also, uh, Douglas Gooden, who's Professor of Neurology and Medical Director at UCSF of the MS Center there. And also, like Jack, a member of the Medical Advisory Board of the National MS Society. And we're going to sort of have a dialogue with them about interdisciplinary research and collaboration. And I know that uh, these neurologists are very interested in this topic and certainly want to make sure that the proper scientific investigation is done so that we do have good science to support uh, uh, our understanding and insight about CCSBI and if indeed what that association looks like and what treatment looks like. So first, I'm going to ask a couple questions to, to Doug and Jack to begin with. And, and I think this may seem obvious, but I'd like Doug to address uh, the question of the value of interdisciplinary research and collaboration when it comes to this, uh, this topic that we're focusing on tonight. Doug? Yeah, I mean, I think that whenever uh, something comes up, a potential treatment, uh, which involves surgery uh, and also involves a medical condition like MS, I think that uh, the two communities need to work very closely together to make sure that we get evidence um, that will stand up uh, to scrutiny. Uh, I think that in this area, I think that there are two fundamental questions that we need to collaborate on. The first is, and I'm sure that many of you are aware, there are two sets of papers actually looking at the diagnosis of this condition. Uh, this started with Zamboni and, and he had 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. That is, everybody who had MS was diagnosed as having a stenosis and none of the control population had a uh, had such a diagnosis. There is not a diagnostic test in medicine which is this good. A pregnancy test is this good. Um, and what's remarkable is that the papers in this area break down basically along two lines. They either show very high sensitivities and specificities or they show zero specificity and zero sensitivity. And this has got to be resolved. If we can't make a diagnosis of venous stenosis, we can't select patients for this procedure, that we have no business, I think, doing it on anybody. The second question, which is obviously more in, of interest to uh, the patient community, is we need to be confident that the procedure actually benefits the patient, and we need to collaborate with the surgeons to look at outcomes. If they're going to do this operation, we need to prove, as well as we can, um, that this actually has a benefit for our patients. And it's slightly peculiar from a neurology perspective that a procedure is being done before it's been proven. I mean, if I say I have a great drug which slams your immune system and I think I should use it because I've had great results in two patients, and then the patients are going to pay for that to be approved, that's not the way it works in medicine. Normally, the pharmaceutical companies that are making those drugs actually have to prove that the drugs are effective before we can administer them. But I think the bottom line is that we need to collaborate together to make sure this condition can be diagnosed and that it actually benefits the patient. Thanks, Doug. And, and so along that line, following up, Jack, how do we foster this type of collaboration that Doug is, uh, is uh, you know, sort of really advocating? And I think we all advocate. What can be done? What's a blueprint for the future of how we can get what we all want? Realizing that there are really cultural differences between a basically an interventional oriented specialty and a, and a more cognitive specialty in terms of how we approach therapy of disease and, and uh, thoughts on that. And then we're going to open up to the audience. Well, let me start by saying, what do I want? Uh, I have family members, best friends, colleagues with multiple sclerosis. I want a treatment. I want a treatment that is is well defined and it can help people and with minimal side effects. So I want this treatment to work. Now what do I need? I need evidence that it has value. And you've heard evidence of, of a handful of patients that have had remarkable results. I can tell you about patients that have not had remarkable results and um, 
Uh, Dr. Arson can also tell you those patients, and he can choose to present four other patients, and you don't even touch this treatment. So the key is we need the balance. And that balance is going to come from collaboration between neurologists, diagnosticians, interventionalists. And so we, we stop guessing. We actually say, this is the potential of who will benefit. We don't know. If the people with relapsing disease will benefit, if the, if the, if the treatment is mainly for people with progressive disease, we have to define that. Um, there's been a 30,000 procedures estimated have been done. And the data on the results, what happened to those 30,000 people is gone. You know, less than 1% have been reported. Uh, that's not very many people, considering 30,000. If we worked together, we'd have a couple hundred, and we could give you results. We'd know for sure with a couple hundred patients. We don't need 30,000 patients, and Dr. Russell was very right. We don't want to be here 20 years from now or 10 years from now with another 100,000 patients who got treated, and, and, and uh, 300 of them have been, uh, we've been able to find out what happened to them. That's why we need collaboration, because we'll get to the answers that you want and that I want if we work together within the bounds of evidence-based medicine, the rules of medicine, um, and, uh, and Sharon said at the beginning, we need not to recommend this procedure except in experimental uh, pro protocols. The, the neighborhood uh, strip mall uh, surgical procedure things for people who've never done a procedure, never been trained, and don't really know how to make a diagnosis, is not good for the patients. And I think that we need science and collaboration, period. Great, thanks. Let me give a quick follow-up to both of you, because I'm going to, as the moderator's prerogative, follow up on that, Jack. So at this time, are we ready for these good, randomized, controlled treatment trials? Doug? <coughs> Um, I think that the first place to begin is we need to be confident that we have uh, a diagnosis that can be made, and I'm very distressed at the disparity in the literature between, and I'd be interested in what your comments are because I'm sure you know this better than I, but there are papers that show zero sensitivity and zero specificity and others that show extraordinarily high ones. Buffalo is sort of in the middle. Um, but what, what, do you, what do you think that the problem is? Well, I think that I think we're going to discuss that, and Gary Siskin, one of our speakers, is also going to answer that directly or look at it. But obviously, I mean, it screams out, as you well know, that there must be some differences in how the test is being performed. If one group's getting zero and one group's getting 100, you're not doing the same thing, okay? Now, in your mind, you have a legitimate reason to say, I don't know which is right, how can I tell? And that, that's fair. But clearly, it's something about, it's not the patient's. It's the test and the operator of the test. And that suggests to me that what we need is to strengthen our criteria and look at this. But I think, uh, in general, Jack, what do you think about, to answer my question, are we ready? You, you seem to think we're losing all these patients that are being treated to, to the ether because we're not doing the right trials. Are we ready to do the trials? I think we're really fortunate tonight to have Dr. Gary Siskin here who probably has done as many, has reported on probably the most of any patients, wouldn't you say, has endured the largest series of patients uh, with outcomes? That's a good start. I think if we can take that, and then we can work on that and develop uh, how to uh, refine that and develop into trials that would be uh, agreeable to all of the specialties. Say, yeah, this makes sense. So What's I'll happening now is I'll not take that as a yes, then, right? Yes. So, so I think, yeah, I, think we, I think we have somebody here who's going to say, "Yeah, we're doing that right now," and you're going to hear that. I think it needs to be fine. I think he would agree with that. I'd be interested in his comments when it comes up uh, about how he would do it differently if he could in the future to get uh, more specificity uh, to the results. Okay. How about the audience? Let's take a couple questions, and we'll bring Gary up, and then we'll have all our panelists come up here, and we'll have a, a nice roundtable. Yes, sir. If there's 30,000 people who have had some form of this treatment, why can't there be some kind of retrospective observational database? Why can't we go back and... Well, well that, that's a very complicated question. Let me com completely first repeat it. If 30,000 people have been treated, why can't we go back and find out what happened to them? Well, one of the reasons that most of these people have been treated in places not near their home, and we've talked about, and Sharon talked about this, Medical tourism going around to different parts of the globe to get a treatment that they can't get 
close to home is not a recipe for getting good follow-up. You might go to India once, but you're not going to go back every six weeks and find out, you know. Obviously, I could, I, fair enough, I'm, if I were a neurologist and my patient went off to India and came back, I'd be a little, you know, I would obviously divorce myself from them, but I wouldn't know how to really, you know, judge what was going on in terms of what happened to their veins and what was even done. So we've lost a lot of people because they haven't been enrolled in these trials that we want to, you know, advocate and facilitate. But we got to do the trials. We can't keep, you know, perpetuating status quo. It's got to get off the hook somewhere here. And I think the right type of trials now need to be done. I think the question is obviously, do we need to prove all of the inner workings of the associations, or are we going to focus on the patient, and are they objectively, quantifiably, using certain metrics, physiologically improving, not subjective reporting, but physiologically. And so to shift the debate from figuring out all the intracerebral blood-brain barrier local environments to actually what happens when you treat. Because as you say, 30,000 we treat, and as Jack says, we've had a tremendous waste of an opportunity. Another question. Yes, well, well we got two, but why don't, why don't we take yours, yes. Where do you guys see the funding coming from to do these large randomized? Great question, there you go. That, both of you guys are, uh, are well situated on various high profile advisory boards and societies, what's gonna happen? Well, I mean, the MS Society has funded <coughs> uh, seven studies, four in Canada and three in the United States, to look at the diagnosis of, uh, of CCSVI and whether there is a consistent venous abnormality in patients who have MS. Uh, so that's, that's one answer. The question of how you corral all these patients who are being treated at the moment, I mean, the fact is that your insurance is funding that. And if that dries up, you're going to have to get some other source. Uh, I also think that uh, you may not be aware of this, but Dr. Siskin has funding from the Canadian MS Society right now for 85 patients. It's a, it's a controlled study. You can tell us, I don't yeah, want to steal one. your thunder, but yeah, there, there is some money can we be able with well-designed studies, I think with well-designed studies we can get uh, funding for this. Yes. Insurance cannot support this sort of a trial because when you have the diagnosis of a mess, uh, is the venous angioplasty is ineligible. MS is the way that insurance currently pays is because the diagnosis usually quoted as venous stenosis, which is confirmed by the venogram or ultrasound. That's how the insurance pays. If if you say MS is the diagnosis, it'll be off the insurance. Right, of course, but but I mean, all of us. I have patients who've had the procedure um, and who've come back. Usually, they've gone to Los Angeles, I think, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, but you know, they had MS. I mean, they were diagnosed as having venous stenosis by somebody and by some test, or they were said to have that, and uh, that the insurance company then paid for it. I don't think the insurance company will pay for a randomized control trial. That oh, is outside of the big That would go drive nuts. I think it would be good to have outcomes. And you, you don't need to have outcomes. Uh, you know, the person who goes to India and comes back, I mean, they're still coming back to the MS clinic, and you can see how they've done, and you could quantitate that. Uh, I think if neurologists showed that there was no benefit on that kind of a trial, then Dr. Dake would say, well, there's a difference in how you do the surgery, and maybe in India they're not doing the surgery very well. Um, that's why you need a randomized control trial where you actually have the same surgeons. And, uh, but we, we ultimately need the randomized control trial, that's, and that needs funding. That needs funding. But, you know, I think that you, you submit a, a grant which has preliminary data that's not a randomized control trial to one of the funding agencies, the National MS Society or the NIH, and I think they would be interested in doing that. I mean, they, they uh, did a randomized control trial of uh, carotid endarterectomy 30 years after the procedure was long exactly. done, but it was it, they finally did it. Uh, so as members of this advisory board, if some of these trials, so the diagnostic trials that the MS Society is supporting are equivocal or mixed in terms of some show, are, are you going to advise that they fund the treatment trial? Well, I, I, I'm very concerned that the, if we can't make the diagnosis, if we can't have a reliable diagnostic test, then I don't know how we're going to recommend rationally the surgery for which patients. 
I, I, have, I have not seen an MS patient yet with normal veins in all the patients I've studied. So we're talking over 450 patients. Uh, the correlation is, is... Right, so <laughs> that, that begs the question of why do these other papers exist from multiple independent labs where they find 0% of the MS patients... Well, well this is going to take time. You're absolutely right. Fair enough. This is going to take time to shake out. And I'm not sure that we have yet established what... I mean, there, and Gary can talk some about this, so let's let's move on to one more question. Yeah, um, well, first I think there's a large source of money for, for whatever, because these drugs are like $35,000 a year, and you know, procedure is 10000 whatever. Um, but, but, you know, there's a huge variation in, in pathology. There's a, there's like almost total lack of follow-up. So like somebody goes to India, who knows, they might get, they might get a thrombosis like the next day, and, you don't know. If somebody comes back to you and, and you know, oh gee, I didn't get better. Well, you don't know. You have no idea because because you have no idea if the you know what the outcome was really. So you're, I think your understanding is, is far too simplistic here. It's not a did he take a pill? Or did he not take a pill? It's what was the condition of this guy's veins? What was the procedure? Is there an outcome? Is there a, is there is there a result from the surgery? No, I mean, there's there's all kinds of stuff, and they pop that. You know, you need to read the literature. The literature includes, you know, taxonomies of, of pathology where there's like, okay, if we have a, a dominant flow versus the, the subdominant flow and it's above a certain amount, then it's almost certainly true that that what's going on is hypoxia and whatever else. Whereas other cases may not be stenotic, et cetera. I mean, you need to have a, a much better understanding than just this black and white thing that you keep talking about. Well, so that you're making an argument, and I agree with you, for a randomized controlled trial. You're saying, I don't really know what happened outside of a randomized controlled trial. You need to know, need to know what you're studying. I think okay. this is a messy area now. I want to encourage our audience, when you come to the mic, we want questions, okay? We're not going to get in a, uh, you know, I don't want to get in debates. I want questions, and these experts can answer the questions. And, uh, but I, I would say that I, I agree, we need these trials. So we have to get together, and collaboration is, the potential for this to realize and actualize these trials has been a cliche to date, and we just need to move forward with it. I think both of you would agree that more dialogue is better, and the sooner the better. So let's, uh, let's, no, we're gonna, I'll hold, I'll give you the first one when we get to the question.